Good afternoon. It's sounding. We're getting a little bit of thunder and um, we're still hoping for some more rain. Um, I don't know how, what it's like at your house, but I could always stand a little shower in the afternoon. Um, it's good to be with you this afternoon. We are in Luke and Acts in a 70 day study, which means we're going through this pretty quick. And um, today we will be discussing Acts chapters six through nine, some, some highlights there. Um, the major themes that we watch for in Acts are, are very similar to the major theme, many of the themes in Luke that the gospel is universal, it's for all people, that um, prayer, there's an emphasis on prayer and an emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Um, and in Acts, we are looking at the nat nature and mission of the church. Uh, this particular section of reading has a lot of individuals mentioned in it, and, um, and their interactions with or against the Holy Spirit. Joys and concerns. Um, Georgia and Bob Clark both have come down with COVID. I think I mentioned that last week, but Georgia had some uh, extenuating issues with it and had to go to the hospital for a bit. I have not heard whether she has been able to go home, although that's what I'm anticipating, that um, she's home now. Um, and Billy Blair is still asking for prayers for her upcoming procedures. Um, and I don't, I don't think there's anybody else. Um, whatever you have on your heart and mind, needs to be lifted up to the Lord. And we would love for you to share that with us, for us to be in, in a prayerful community supporting you uh, and, and what is going on in your life. So be sure and let me know if that's something that you want and need. Let's have a word of prayer. Good afternoon, Father. We, your children, take a deep breath of you and breathe out self. That is the desire of our heart, to be full of you, so that anyone who sees us or anyone who hears us is getting an image of you, Father, of your love and your grace and your mercy. We ask, Father, that you be with this particular body of your believers in the months ahead as we have entered a period of discernment Pull us into you, Father, that we might hear you and perceive your guidance in the issues that we are considering. We seek to please you. We seek for you to delight in us. We seek to be kingdom builders. And we want to do that work having you work through us to accomplish your will and your way open our hearts and minds today father as we take a look at the book of acts from scripture we we know that this tells us a lot about the early church a lot about how the church functions with your power and how the church grows with your power. We submit ourselves to that, Father. We submit ourselves to 
compassion for you that leads to your kingdom coming in us and around us. And we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit on brothers and sisters around the world, comforting them in their sorrows, healing them in their pain, feeding them in their hunger and thirst. We lean into you, Father, for all that ails mankind. We know that being in right relationship with you is where our salvation is. And we lift up all of these concerns and others that are on our hearts in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our hymn for today is the church's one foundation. As it was for the early church, so it is for us today. The church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation, by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her, to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. Elect from every nation, yet one o'er all the earth. Her charter of salvation, one Lord, one faith, one birth. One holy name she blesses, partakes one holy food. And to one hope she presses with every grace endued. Yes, to one hope the church presses. And that is our hope in the Lord. Let's read our opening. We commit ourselves individually and as a community to the way of Christ to take up the cross, to seek abundant life for all humanity, to struggle for peace with justice and freedom, to risk ourselves in faith, hope, and love, praying that God's kingdom may come. The scriptures that we're gonna look at today in Acts have elements of this opening in them because the community that gathered as the early church was committed to the way of Christ. They shared all their personal resources so that no one would be going without. And they struggled um, to establish peace in their community. And many risked themselves in the name of Jesus so that God's kingdom could come more fully on the earth. Um, the Gospels link the promises of God in, to Israel from the Old Testament. They link those promises with the coming of Jesus in the New Testament. And the book of Acts links Jesus to the church which bears his name of Christianity. All that they do is in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I would like for you to really watch and listen for the Holy Spirit in the interactions that we're going to look at in chapter six. Um, and chapter six, just real quickly, um, starts with some problem solving over what we can, what are sort of practical issues. Uh, we know that they shared their resources. 
and the most vulnerable in the group as in their society were the widows. Well, there were two groups of widows. There were the widows that were Jewish, that were Hebrew speaking, and there were widows that were Jewish, that were Greek speaking, which indicates that at some point they had been part of a dispersion and had been away from Jerusalem and now find themselves back there. Um, and because most of those who were distributing the food were of Hebrew background, there was some suspicions and some complaints that the Greek widows were being discriminated against and not receiving their fair share of the food. And uh, you can just sort of hear the pastors, hear the apostles saying, uh, we really don't have time to deal with this. We, we are supposed to be spreading the gospel. We were picked and chosen and commissioned to spread the gospel. So if we're here, and even though it is important that the food be distributed fairly, we think somebody else should probably be doing that task so that we can be about the kingdom building. And they appointed seven um, spirit-filled young men from the group, most of whom were of Greek background, to um, serve and distribute the food to the widows in a fair way. Um, two of those we hear from with just in a few verses, they are no longer, no longer mainly distributing food. They are preaching and teaching and doing missionary work. And that's Stephen and Philip. Um, so first we're going to look at Stephen and the Holy Spirit. And as Stephen grew from his food distribution responsibilities, his faith started attracting attention. There was opposition to him among the members of the synagogue. And this was happening because Stephen was going to the synagogue and preaching and teaching the gospel message. Uh, I'll read to you a little bit from Acts 6, 7 through 10, and then verse 15. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. And that's good news, right? Um, remember when Jesus was um, ascending, or right before he ascended into heaven, he gave the commission to preach the word in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria. And so here they are in Jerusalem. This is in the beginning stages. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedman, as it was called. Jews that were from Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the promise, uh, provinces of Cilicia and Asia. So these are folks that had been in other areas and had come back and formed the synagogue of the freedmen. They were no longer slaves in a foreign land. And they began to argue with Stephen. Verse 10 says, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Jesus had said for them not to worry about what it was that they would need to say because he would provide that for them. And sure enough, Stephen's been given the wisdom of the Holy Spirit as he speaks. The leaders because they can't hold their own with him in discussions, end up accusing him of blasphemy, much as Christ was um, accused. It, some of the accusations had to do with uh, the temple being destroyed 
and being raised again in three days, which we know had to do with the body of Christ, that Christ was the temple. But they believe that Stephen and Jesus were speaking against the actual temple and about the destruction of the actual temple. And so they brought him before the council, the Sanhedrin, uh, using false witnesses to testify against him. Verse 15 says, All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. It's pretty uh, sure that that's due to the fact that he was experiencing an indwelling of the Holy Spirit and that that is why his face shone like an angel. And Stephen didn't try to defend himself. They asked him about these blasphemy charges and gave him the floor. And he used that opportunity to speak to them uh, on a variety of, on a, their history a lot and build it into an understanding of the gospel. And so he delivers this lengthy speech. In fact, it's the longest thing that's recorded in um, speech that's recorded in Acts about the history of the Israelites. And we all know that when you read through the Old Testament, the story of God's people and God is an up and down uh, experience. They would be in, pull in close, God will pull them in close to him and they would be there for a while and then they would turn away and be corrupted and uh, turn, turn away from him. And then things would get really bad and they would be pulled back into right relationship with God. And it's laudable that as the Israelites recorded their history, that they recorded not only the victories, but the failures. And so Stephen is using their own scripture to bring, to freshen up in their mind the fact that things have not always gone well with them in their relationship with God, that there are many instances in their history where they have um, failed in, in that relationship failed to be obedient people, failed to be loving people. And uh, they really couldn't argue with him because he's just telling their own story from their own scripture. Um, every Jew knew the, this story by heart. And um, even the ones that opposed Stephen had to agree with him because they all knew that what he was saying was the truth from their history. And he's pointing out in particular as it goes on how they had a history of rejecting God's message and rejecting God and rejecting God's messengers that were sent to them. The leaders of Israel have been infamous for rejecting God's attempts to save them. And he's just using their own scripture uh, to bring this to light. And he ends up with some really harsh accusations against the leaders. Uh, uh, in Acts 7, 51 through 53, you stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. So we have this choice. We, all people, have this choice of responding to the Holy Spirit by opening to the Holy Spirit and submitting or by resisting the Holy Spirit and opposing. Uh, when Stephen mentions their hearts and ears are still uncircumcised, I don't think there's really such a thing as a circumcised heart and a circumcised ear. 
we know that circumcision had to do with the mark of the covenant between God and his people and was something underwent a, pr a procedure that was underwent by men. But he's speaking of it in a not literal way. He's saying your hearts have not been um, marked for God. Your ears still do not hear God. They haven't been open to him. Um, was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You have received the law that was given through the angels, but have not obeyed it. God entrusted these leaders with the law and they haven't been true to it. They haven't been faithful to it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. He had a vision. He was granted a vision. And Jesus was standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Well, the Sanhedrin was already mad at him for calling them murderers and uh, pointing out all of their failures and rejections. And now he's saying he has a vision of the Lord God and Jesus at his right hand. Uh, that just sent them over the edge. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. This uh, was their same solution to the problem of Jesus. He created issues for them and their solution, instead of looking at the issues and looking at themselves, was to destroy him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. This is Luke's um, little introduction to Saul, who becomes ever more uh, important as the story goes on. So this started off with what looked like a trial, but now it has degenerated into mob violence. And while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, Receive my spirit. When Jesus was at being crucified, he said, Lord, into your hands I commend my spirit. So, Stephen. Then he fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them, which is the echo of Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And when he said this, he fell asleep, which is, of course, the euphemism for death. Um, and all, and, and Luke is sure to add here, and Saul was there giving approval to his death. Stephen, we're going to deal with that first, but Stephen dies with dignity, honoring his Lord and Savior. And he is known as the first martyr of the church. Interestingly enough, that word martyr um, has gotten to be sort of a standard joke in our congregation to talk about word origins uh, sometimes. But this is an important one because originally the word martyr was Greek and it was a word that stood for witness or testimony. But the ferocious persecution of Christians 
early on change that meaning to one who died for what one believes. So originally it just meant standing up for what you believe. But because the Christians were so persecuted, the meaning shifted to a martyr is one who dies for what one believes. Um, and just a brief mention of Saul here, it's, it seems imperative that Luke wants us to see at this point that Saul's function was as an enemy of the church, an enemy of believers. At this point, uh, at Stephen's death is sort of a turning point, and it, it goes into uh, the, a great period of persecution and a period where those uh, of the congregation in, um, in Jerusalem scatter. And it says that it, the, everyone scattered except for the apostles. But indeed, the apostles, too, eventually started uh, moving out. And Saul was one of the most zealous persecutors trying to destroy the church. Now we are introduced to Philip. And after his uh, being appointed as one helping with the distribution of food to the widows, now we're going to be looking at Philip in ministry and in mission. And uh, you have some maps there that you can look at, but Philip is in ministry in the area of Samaria. Now remember, Jesus' commission was and preached the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, which is a larger area than the city of Jerusalem. It is a larger area. And Samaria is where the area has widened even more. Um, and in this area of Samaria, uh, we've talked about it, so I'm not going to spend much time on that, but we know that they were, um, there was a lot of hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans. They had common ancestry, but they had... Uh, branched off and, and both considered to the other to be a corrupt form of the faith. Um, well, here's Philip preaching in Samaria. And there is a gentleman there who is famous as a magician, a sorcerer. Simon, the magician, becomes interested in the power that he sees that's being displayed by Philip. And then as Peter and John come into Samaria, he is seeing their power, um, which we know to be the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, strikingly enough, he decides he needs to purchase some of that power. In Acts 8, 20 through 21, Peter addresses Simon's request to purchase some of this terrific power he sees. Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Luke is making three important uh, points in this little story about Simon the magician. The first point he's making is that the message is moving out of Jerusalem. It's moved out of Judea into Samaria. And, um, and that would be considered not quite a Gentile area because they were a little bit of both. The folks in Samaria were a little bit Gentile and a little bit Jew. And so this is understandably the next step as the, as the word is spread. Starts off in the heart of Judaism and it's spreading into areas that are 
not fully Jewish, but not fully Gentile, on its way into the Gentile world. Um, the second point that Luke is trying to make is that the gospel is not magic. Now, magic was an attempt by um, an individual to control God and to manipulate God's power to do the magician's will. And the gospel, we know, is the opposite of that. It is that we put ourselves at God's disposal to do God's will. And the third point about uh, in this story is that the gospel is not for sale. It is a gift from God. It is not a commodity for the power hungry that can be purchased. It comes through a saving relationship with God. That power is poured into our lives. Uh, then quickly, we get another encounter with Philip with the Ethiopian. And um, I have to be honest with you, I planned on including a section and talking about it at more length. But when the pastors preached on it on Sunday, I think they covered that topic pretty well. And I would say to you, if you missed it, and you're curious about the Ethiopian and, and Philip's encounter, go back and listen to one of our pastor's sermons uh, from last Sunday. <clears throat> but I will say that this encounter with the Ethiopian leads to the Ethiopian um, baptism. Now, this is someone who was completely outside of Judaism, except he was a God-fearer because when Philip sees him, he's reading scripture. And so Philip spends some time explaining the scripture to him. And, and um, the Ethiopian chooses to be baptized and is rejoicing all the way back home, which is Africa. And uh, you can see on your map where, where that is because they were on the road to Gaza is where Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch uh, had their encounter. During all of this time, while the ministry is going on, Saul is the enemy of the church. And while he is on this path of destruction, he stops short. He has an encounter with the risen Christ that changes him forever. <coughs> Excuse me. Acts 9, 3 through 6. Um, as he neared Damascus on his journey, and if you'll look on your map, you will see that Damascus is located north of the Sea of Galilee and west. It, it's further away than a lot of the other places that they're preaching and teaching. During this time, Saul is the enemy of the church, and he's um, and so we're going to see what happened on this trip to Damascus. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? We are to understand in that question from the risen Lord, that to persecute the community of Jesus' followers is to persecute Christ himself. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And I think it's very interesting that this image that I have of Saul, of a very aggressive, uh, very singly focused enemy of the church, he has this brief, although powerful, encounter with Jesus, and he's done with arguing. You don't, you don't hear any, 
you don't hear any arguing after he says, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Jesus gives him directions, and as far as we know, Saul is, is obedient. Um, in this story, we see Saul with a call on his life, a, call, a direct call from Christ. But he's not the only one. There are two others that are called into service directly related to Saul. Um, and one of the things that we notice in the first one is not everyone responds to a call from God enthusiastically. And thank goodness God includes quite a few of uh, folks like that because I think a lot of us are, are like that. When we uh, find ourselves being called by God, frequently we are hesitant to um, join right in. So it's a good thing that we see that God is able to use those folks and, and to use us. The Lord calls Ananias, that was a disciple in the city of Damascus, to go to Saul and lay hands on him to restore his sight. And Ananias is very hesitant. Why? Because of Saul's reputation as a murderer, a persecutor of Christians, and he's afraid. Um, and God insists. God says that Saul is his chosen instrument. And so Ananias submits in obedience. It goes on to read, Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. And he got up and was baptized. And what we have here is a physical healing of blindness and a spiritual healing of blindness. The scales that fell from his eyes, uh, there were uh, metaphorically scales that fell from his heart that opened him up to the Holy Spirit. Um, and next we have Barnabas. And um, Barnabas didn't actually, get, we don't have any record that he was being told what to do, but we do know uh, from other um, writings of Luke that Barnabas was uh, a man full of Holy Spirit. And so, when Paul went to the congregation in Jerusalem, he met with the same kind of opposition because of his violent past. They didn't trust him. They thought perhaps he had been sent to infiltrate them and make them weak so that they could be overcome and, uh, or that perhaps he would do violence to them himself. But Barnabas stood up for Paul, or Saul rather, and vouched for his sincerity. When he came to Jerusalem, this is Saul, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul, on his journey, had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So. Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. But that didn't last um, a long time. Uh, eventually, Paul had to flee Jerusalem. Just looking at Barnabas, though, for a minute, it's important to see here that preachers and teachers are not the only important folks of great value to the life of the church and to the spread of the church. Sometimes sons and daughters of encouragement, which was Barnabas's reputation as a son of encouragement, um, bring out the best in others. And those, uh, that's such an important function 
within the faith community. We see the gospel is growing in an ever widening circle. It's breaking all barriers and it's uniting into one faith all kinds of people who have no cultural commonalities. They, have, they are a diverse group of people on every account, but the gospel unifies them. Oh, but what the gospel could unify us today. Acts 9, 31 says, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and strength and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. Uh, next week, we will be looking at uh, chapters 10 through 14 together. And uh, I ask that you, I remind you, watch the video, do your daily readings, look at the discussion questions because in, in a, the short period of one lesson, we really don't have time to cover all of those concepts, but Pastor Dan has put a lot of time into the research and into those questions that might uh, open things up more for each of us. So I, I recommend that you look at those for yourself. Let's read our closing. We rejoice in every sign of God's kingdom, in the upholding of human dignity and community, in every expression of love, justice, and reconciliation, in each act of self-giving on the behalf of others, in the abundance of God's gift entrusted to us that all may have enough. Amen.